So uh, well, uh, I want to say what is Gorenstein third dimension for? So you know this is one of the frontiers of science. Uh, uh, so so let me let me say what uh, I understand by this the following situation. I have a ring which is a quotient of the polynomial ring. And it has a projective, a free resolution like this. So here I've got A, this polynomial ring. So K, X naught up to Xn. <coughs> and it's graded in degrees in positive degrees. So it's n graded. Each of the x's has some positive degrees. You can take all degree 1 if you like. Uh, and so p naught is a, and r is a modulo and ideal. p1 is generators of a, of i. And then p1 and so on, and the others are zizages. Right, and so the, the fact that this is a this free so the, the, this is an exact sequence of a modules. The fact that the resolution stops, free resolution stops at p four, is if and only if Kern Macaulay. If you, you should say if the co-dimension is four. I'm assuming I'm assuming that. Uh, so spec R inside spec of A has co-dimension 4. I, I'll, I'll be doing mostly very concrete examples, but uh, right. And then P4 equals, <coughs> so isomorphic to A, but actually, these are graded modules, so it's really A of minus alpha. So as a graded module, it's A of minus alpha. That's just A, but with some uh, convention about grading. Right, this is the Gorenstein condition. And if you have Gorenstein, then P of I is you know, as isomorphic, P of, there's a sim this thing is symmetric. So P of I is sort of the same thing as P of 4 minus I. And the, the right way to say this is that there's a, uh, there's a pairing, P I times P 4 minus I, maps to P 4, and this is a perfect pairing. And uh, you can make it symmetric. I'm not talking about how these things are proved, I'm saying what the, uh, what the effect is. So this is uh, uh, Buxbaum Eisenbad, uh, right? And so what this means is that P1 is... Why symmetric and not also skew-symmetric? It's symmetric. Skew-symmetric is a particular case of symmetric. It's plus or minus one symmetric. Yes. Yeah, That's what symmetric means. Anyway, I'm, uh, I'm concerned with a specific case and... Uh, so this means that P1 is K plus 1 times A. So it's a free A module of rank K plus 1. Or if you like, if you want to put in the grading, it's direct sum of A of minus uh, DI. DI are just the degrees of the defining equations. And this is uh, K plus 1 copies. Yeah? And so I told you what P1 is. I told you what P4 is. And I told you it was a perfect pairing, so that tells you what P3 is, right? But the interesting thing is P2, and the P2 is 2K times A, and it has on it a quadratic form, 0, 1, 1, 0. Right, so... Uh, uh, let's assume that K is algebraically closed 
and that K contains one half, so we're, uh, it's a field of characteristic not equal to, then after you know messing around a bit, changing bases, you can get that, the, that this P2 has a quadratic form, which is this shape. Right? And so it's not just it's not just these modules that are symmetric, but also the maps between the modules are symmetric. So this bit in the middle here, P2 goes to P1. This is given by a matrix, and this is given by another matrix. And um, you know, I'm sure some of you do computer algebra, and you tell the computer to multiply two matrices, and it says, error, the matrices are the wrong size to be multiplied. So I don't really, this is, a, this is a, a matrix M, so M is K plus 1 times 2K. And the thing that's here is 0, 1, 1, 0 transpose of M. Yes? <coughs> So I'm saying there is a symmetry. P1 and P3 are sort of dual, to, dual vector spaces. P2 is a vector space with this quadratic form. And the whole thing is, has duality with respect to Homer into P4. Yeah? And so the effect is there is a single matrix, which is k plus 1 by 2k, which tells you what the middle of this complex is. Yeah, and uh, so this is always 9 by 16 in hundreds of cases. So of course you can make, cons you can make, if, if the for the Cauchel complex it's 4 times 6. So if you have a complete intersection of co-dimension 4, you have not 9 by 16, but 4, 4 times 6, and so on. And you can make 7 by 12 or uh, 11 by uh, uh, 20 if you want to. But uh, if, you, if you start doing this calculation, and uh, you know many of us have been doing this for 30 years now, then you will find in essentially every case you ever study, this is 9 by 16. Right? And um, so what is this? So uh, uh, as I said, when I have a matrix, I don't really know which are the rows and the columns. So you know, if I write down a matrix M, sometimes I'm in transpose of M. And you know, basically, it's the computer's business to figure out which is which. Is which. <coughs> so M has nine uh, either rows or columns, I don't know. Let's say columns. And they are isotropic. I suggest rows, but... <laughs> uh, they're rows, yes. You're quite right. That's why I made my apology about not knowing the rows from the columns. Okay, so the thing that's written on, in, uh, on, the, sheet on the sheet in front of you is, a, is a, the transpose of a 9 by 16 matrix. But when you write down these nine vectors, they are isotropic with respect to this non-degenerate quadratic form. Right? So somewhere in the middle here, I have, uh, you know, this is like, this is like C to the 16th with a standard quadratic form. And I'm trying to shoot into it nine vectors that are uh, mutually, that are uh, have square zero and orthogonal to each other. Right? And therefore there is a linear dependence relation between them. And so the, uh, the map here L and the map here L transpose. So uh, L is the kernel or co kernel of M. Right? So I'm trying to put nine vectors into a quadratic form so that they, uh, so they span an isotropic subspace 
and the maximum isotropic subspace of this quadratic form has dimension 16, and therefore there's a linear dependence relation between them. Right? And so this is a kind of theoretical statement of the Gorenstein co-dimension 4 problem. It doesn't solve anything, it just states the problem. I have to write down a complex with this shape, <coughs> with coefficients in some ring, and then I have to figure out what the co-kernel of, uh, of this matrix M is. Right? And so, uh, you know, this is a problem I don't know how to, nobody knows how to answer. So what you're pointing out that M describes everything. M knows everything. So the Zizidy matrix knows more than the equations. Right? So, you know, uh, I hope people here know the Buxbaum Eisenberg theorem in codimension three. Codimension three Gorenstein ideal is generated by the maximal Fafians of a 2k plus one by 2k plus one skew matrix. Right? So the great thing there is there is a single matrix, 2k plus one by 2k plus one, five by five in all practical cases, skew symmetric, which knows not only the equations, but also the zizages that hold between the equations. The, the first matrix of first cities knows more about the ideal than the equations. Right? And uh, so, you know, how to form... How to form M... So, in other words, what's the structure of M that makes it possible for it to uh, satisfy these conditions? And how to... How to write... L as a function of M, uh, I, I don't know. You don't know in all cases. I don't know in all cases. No, no. So there are very many cases. So, so this was the hard thing. So if you if you look at the, ma at the matrix you have in front of you, this uh, nine, uh, nine, nine by six, transpose of a nine by sixteen matrix then, uh, you know, it has this property. <coughs> and it also has lots and lots of other completely bizarre and beautiful symmetries. Th this matrix occurs in actual combat. This is, uh, this is something that uh, comes up in a, a calculation coming from Horikawa's Cosberg surfaces. And, uh, you know, it's a very, very complicated structure. Uh, so let me, say, let me say a few words about uh, I want to say a few words at the end about how I hope to get further information from this, right? Because the thing, one of the thing, one of the objects we're talking about here is the uh, the orthogonal Grassmannian, o, uh, o, o, o Grassmannian eight sixteen, and we know a lot about it. We know, you know, his, uh, there's the symmetry under the vial group of D eight, for example. And so there's a lot of stuff we know there, and we know that if you take the Plucker equations, <coughs> so you know, if somebody gives you a 9 by 16 matrix and asks you to find the kernel, the co-kernel, then you, know, you have to go away and calculate all of its 8 by 8 minors, and then you have to take out the common factors in those. So uh, you know, the, already the number of 8 by 8, 8, by 8 minors of this matrix is already something that just the number of them, just saying what is to be calculated, is a problem that defeats most computer algebra systems. On the other hand, everybody knows that the Plucker embedding of orthogonal Grassmannian 816 is the square of the spinner embedding. And so uh, taking the spinner embedding instead of the Plucker embedding should solve the problem should contribute, should be part of the solution to the problem. So, so already the spinner, the taking spinner coordinates and so on is already complicated business and, and doesn't solve the problem in this, uh, in this case. However, it's very, very, it makes lots of very uh, strong suggestions. And so I believe that so there is which something... Which are you were you talking about? The G? Our <coughs> total oh, Gasmania, eight. Okay. Right. And so this has a this has a Plucker embedding given by eight by eight minus. 
So this is the clipper embedding, and this is the this is the symmetric square of the spinner embedding. But the problem, you know, the problem with the matrix you have in front of you is, I want the equations to be quadratic functions of the syzygies. Right? And there are sort of lots of <coughs> plausible hints contained in that sheet. But on the other hand, if I, take, if I take that matrix and I take its spinner coordinates in a way that I can describe precisely, you get polynomials of completely the wrong degree. It's still a polynomial of degree 4, and you still have to factorize those and take out more factors. So it's a complicated business. OK, so that was the hard part. I'll make some more remarks about that at the end if I have time. Uh, let me do some easier stuff now. So I'm, I'm going to talk about the... So there are hundreds of cases in which we know exactly how to write down co-dimensional four Gorenstein rings. And uh, a lot of these are Tom and Je uh, based on un unprojection. So the idea here is that uh, we take... Uh, take the nine equations and we can separate them. So separate them somehow. Uh, this, is a, this is a practical matter, not a, not a theoretical matter. Separate them into four that involve uh, some variable x0 uh, linearly only so only linearly, and five others. Right, and then, uh, and then I, I, I eliminate x0, and I get something Gorenstein co-dimension 3. And then I can recover the original thing by this process we call unprojection. So I want to give a couple of examples of this, because it's uh, you know, something that everybody can relate to very easily. So uh, let me talk about um, uh, the Segre embedding of P2. So this is something that everybody's, everybody here has thought about. And uh, a number of you have heard me lecture about this at KAIST uh, about six months ago. So Segre of P2 cross P2 is contained in P8. Yeah, so the canonical class of P2 cross P2 is minus 3, minus 3. I'm embedding it by 1, 1, so the canonical class is minus 3 times the plane section here. And this is co-dimension 4, uh, so this is a co-dimension uh, co 4 Bernstein. And so, you know, let's write the, the coordinates in here. So the coordinates are guys from here times guys from there. And I can write the equations in the following form, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I. So if you can keep your algebra, you want your <coughs> variables to be nice and short. Yeah? And I want to write uh, 2 by 2 minus of this equals 0. Yeah? So in intrinsically, I've got... Uh, you know, the, the given three-dimensional representation of GL3, I take the product of two of those, that's now a representation of GL3 cross GL3, and uh, I'm, I'm working here in the tensor product of the two given representations, right? And this, this is the equations that define the tensors of rank less than or equal to 1. Right. So, uh, you know, I don't know who X0 is, but, uh, you know, the matrix makes some plausible suggestions. So let's take this guy A. So I can take this as AE equals something, AF equals something, AH equals something, AI equals something. Right. And then plus five equations uh, without A. Yes, and the five equations are, uh, so the remaining equations are 
uh, the uh, can be can be written as Uh, uh, the Fafians so Fafians of and uh, I don't know if I'll get it right so, so you know I mean anybody, anybody can do this calculation and uh, so I write B C D G, I'm, I'm sure most of you have seen me do this before. O, E, H, F, I, 0. Okay, so this is a 5 by 5 skew-symmetric matrix. Yes? So I'm uh, waiting for somebody to object and say it's only 4 by 4. So what, uh, here I, I don't write the diagonal entries, which are all 0, so there's no point in writing them. And I don't write the anti-symmetric elements. Right? So this is the entry M12. Uh, M13, M12, M15. Right? And here I have M45. Okay, so uh, if, uh, I hope everybody knows how to calculate 4 by 4 Fafians. What you have to do is B times F minus C times Z plus D times 0. Right? So the presence of these two zeros here mean that uh, there are no, none of the Fafians actually involve three terms. And uh, what you get are these uh, 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 exactly the same equations as... Uh, if I wrote B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, will this guy censored out? Right. <clears throat> so I write two by two minus of that, and you're not allowed to say A. Then you get then you get these equations. So there are five equations here: B, F equals C, E, and so on and so forth. They're just the remaining nine equations there. So what is this? So geometrically speaking, this is I take P two cross P two. I take the typical point in there, so I take the point 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, right, and I make the linear projection to some new variety V inside P of, so we were in P8, we're now in P7, right, and now this is, this one was Gorenstein co-dimension 4, this one is Gorenstein co-dimension 3, and so this one is, should be given by the 5 by 5 matrix. So this V, this V is the intersection of the Grassmannian 2, 5 with a uh, suitable P7. Right? So I take uh, the, if, if these entries weren't zero but were some, uh, <coughs> Uh, some independent indeterminants, I'd have the equations of Grassmannian 2, 5. Right? And I've taken Grassmannian 2, 5, and I've cut it by two hyperplanes. So this is uh, Grassmannian 2, 5, intersect H1, intersect H2. And this is, uh, this is just saying M1, 2 equals, M2, sorry, M2, 3 equals 0, M4, 5. Yeah, very simple. Uh, uh, the simplest possible hyperplane sections of this Grassmannian, and uh, this this is a linear section of the Grassmannian. So it's a, so if I, I can call this one X, for example, and the X contains the plane pi. So what's the difference between X and V? Uh, okay, very good. It was V. Okay, so uh, this contains this linear subspace given by B equals C equals D equals G equals C. Right, so this one here is Gorenstein co-dimension 4. 
and it, a complete, in fact, a complete intersection. And this is uh, Gorenstein co-dimension three. Right. So there's a theorem saying whenever you have this situation, you can do an unprojection. You can put in a new variable, which is determined by the adjunction theorem. The, the new variable is something, is basically a differential form on x with poles along pi that generates the canonical class of pi. So, you know, you, do, you have to do your Grotenik duality properly if you want to, you have to do the adjunction theorem properly here. But there's a, so given, given this uh, x contains pi, I can unproject. To get uh, to get the original the, to get this variety to get back co-dimension four okay so uh, so notice what I've done here I've got I've got a five by five skew matrix so it's something that defines a regular pullback from the grass money right. And I say, I want this to contain a Gorenstein co-dimension 4 sub-variety. So here, I don't know how, you know, I mean, in general, there might be complicated solutions. Sorry, to, to get back a, a, a co-dimension 4 uh, variety, you need the... So this that's, is a that's divisor. Right. This is a divisor. Yes, but yes. Right. So this is V equals C equals D equals D. No, no, no. I mean, in which stuff. generality do you get a co-dimension four by M projection? Uh, you, because you made a very general statement. Uh, the uh, the theorems published about M projection are very general indeed. So there, uh, you know, you need you need what I said: co-dimension four, Gorenstein, co-dimension three, Gorenstein, one contained in the other. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you want to do it graded. You have to do something to ensure that the unprojection variable has positive degree. Mm -hmm. If you want to stay gener gen uh, in positive degree, right? But there are no non-singularity assumptions. The only thing you need is the homological algebra, the kern mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. You know? uh, this is really very general. You know, we have these papers. Uh, we have these papers. Uh, I'm sure you've seen Stavros Papadakis, Christine and Vela from around 1980. My question was on the co-dimension. If you take any uh, yeah, Gorenstein yeah, yeah, co-dimension so three a divisor, so look, which is uh, Gorenstein. So let me let me let me let me say, say this. So you know, I mean, this is really very elementary mathematics that everybody has seen. So here is del Pezzo S five in P five, del Pezzo surface degree five, and I'm saying choose a line in there. So a line in there is a co-dimension four complete intersection. Then there is an unprojection here, which is T6 inside P5, inside P6, which is the del Pezzo of degree 6. Mm -hmm. Right? And I'm, I'm saying, and you can extend this out another couple of dimensions to these, uh, to these four folds. Yeah, so, so the unprojection here, in this case, is just Castelnovo's uh, um, intractability just a, a small, a small step sideways from that. So, uh, so you know, if you ask uh, now, I ask the question: How do you achieve this thing, having a co-dimension Gorenstein co-dimension three containing a Gorenstein co-dimension four thing? Well, in general, we don't know. But here is a completely practical thing to do. I'm taking the skew symmetric matrix that defines the co-dimension three guy, and I'm saying I take one row, so this is row one, it's also column one, column one would have exactly the same entries, right, and I say all the entries, the mij with ij not equal to one, so in other words all of these six entries here, Mm. I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I'm uh, very But sorry. I mean, if you put B equal E equal H equal zero, then you get something of um, 
a linear I'm, space I'm, of I'm very sorry, three. I said was completely wrong. I'm going to take E equals H equals F equals F. Okay, okay. The second row. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not the second row. The complement of the first row. Ah, uh, okay. E so I want these guys here to belong to the co-dimension for complete intersection ID. Yes? So, uh, you know, there are six entries here. Right? And I say, I don't want those six entries to be general. I want them to belong, to be contained in a co-dimension four complete intersection ideal. Right? And that means, you know, the simplest way that can happen is for two of these guys to be zero. Right? Or it could happen, you know, I could put E here, or I could put I there. And so on. But, you know, actually in this case you could just uh, remove those by coordinate transformation, by row and column operations. So this is a, the, a general codimension four format, which is giving me a, a, a way, a kind of guaranteed, clear-cut uh, format for constructing a family of uh, varieties of ideals. This family, and if you stay within the family, then the um, the, the family is unobstructed. Right? The rules of the game are, here's the shape of my matrix. I've declared it's going to be a, this is called Tom 1. This is a, here's a 5 by 5 matrix. You're allowed to put anything you like in the ring there. And you're allowed to put anything you like here, as long as it's in this given co-dimension 4 complete intersection idea. Right? So, you know, we can do this in computer algebra very easily. Just tell the computer, write down a random element or a, a generic element or whatever you like in a given ring or in a given ide ideal of a ring, and uh, you get your equation. And so, uh, you know, this gives this construction here, Tom, these Tom constructions give, uh, you know, I don't know, about 200 examples in co uh, of these co dimension four. Um, Q Fano varieties of index one. So we know how to construct about 200 of these, of, uh, of these varieties, and we're doing them by this simple method, and we get non uh, quasi smooth varieties, varieties having only, uh, term, uh, only terminal quotient singularity. Okay, so I don't want to give an example of that because I want to go on to uh, uh, Jerry. So I want to discuss again. You know, this is a, this is something which you can approach from a very elementary point of view. Everybody knows. Uh, so if I take a canonical <coughs> curve of genus six. So this is a curve here. And I'm taking its canonical uh, linear system, Kc, and I'm embedding it into P5. Right, so this is co-dimension 4, and it's uh, Gorenstein, and it has all of this Castellova, Petri stuff associated with it. So we know that uh, these curves are either hyperelliptic, In that case, uh, so in a different section, uh, different treatments. So if they're hyperelliptic, then they're not embedded like this, or they're trigonal, and then there's uh, a different treatment as well. Or they are uh, Brasmanian 2-5, uh, sorry, sorry, G25, they have a, 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 an embedding of, uh, let, let me come back to this. Uh, all, all they are, are S5, del pezzo 5, intersect a quadrant. Right, so this is del pezzo 5. So these guys here are given by a 5 by 5 uh, Fafian format, and then one extra quadratic equation, which is 
uh, cutting out a complete insection inside the delta so far. Right? So let me make some comments about this one. Right? And the problem I want to raise here, the problem I want to treat by my methods, is to say, I take a curve which is in here, it's given by equations in some funny way, in some funny format, and I want to deform those equations to get this one. Right? And so there's abs abs everybody, everybody present here knows how to write down the general curve in this form, right? and knows how to write down the general form in this, in this form. The, 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 issue, the issue is how to deform these guys to these guys. Right? And the same thing applies to uh, to any. Uh, so these are the sextics with four uh, double points. These are these are plain quintics. No, S five intersected the quadrant. Yeah, sextic with four double points. Uh, there, are lots of, there are several different ways of constructing them. The most uh, systematic is Mukai's, Mukai's method. Mm -hmm. So these guys have, in general, five G15s. Right? And they're P2. They've got a model in P2 with, uh, of degree something or other with four double points and a, conic part, a system of conics mm -hmm. passing through those. Those are the five G15s. But anyway, you can do this by one means one Let's means one. You can do these by lots of different methods. Mm -hmm. right. But I want to talk about this uh, root 2, 5. And what we're talking about here is uh, uh, varieties of odd degree in uh, uh, second Veronese of P2. Right. And you can also do this for weighted, also weighted P2. Right, so I'm taking, uh, the thing I'm, I've got here is, uh, uh, let me see if I can get this right. Um, so, uh, so I'm talking about this completely classical problem, but at the end I will be writing down something which is a key variety which is a construction of a big variety at, from which you can obtain other varieties by regular pullback. Uh, so, so uh, I mean, just concentrate for the moment on this case, but it is really wide open. So here I've got P2. So let, let me, uh, uh, for some reason or other, I've got X1, X2, X3 here as coordinates. <coughs> Right, and then inside here I've got C5. And this, so this C5 is given by F5 equals zero. And then I'm going to take the second Veronese embedding. So I have new, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. There we go, C. These are UVW. So uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to write x1 equals u squared and so on, and uh, so x1, x2, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6, x4, x5. So, uh, so I'm taking the second Veronese embedding of this guy. So, you know, x2 is uv. Yeah, and so this is the second Veronese embedding takes P2 and embeds it into P5. Right, and uh, so I'm not allowed to say U, UVW. I'm only allowed to say elements of even degree in UV and W, and all those elements of even degree in UV and W can be written in, the, in this uh, as polynomials in these guys. Right, and uh, wedge two of this equals zero is the equations of the Veronese. Yes? And so, uh, you know, my C5, 
So the, the, the problem with C5 is, C5 in there is a hypersurface. It's given by one equation. So uh, let's take this equation F5. Well, I told you, the F5 is of odd degree, and so I'm not allowed to write down F5 here. Right? So instead, so, so, so call this, um, you know, I don't know, uh, S in P5. So C in S so is, is not S? S is what, the S or no? a hypersurface. <coughs> it's a divisor, but it's not a divisor linearly equivalent to a, hi to a, hi to a intersection so with a hypersurface. Which guy is S? S is for V2. Ah, uh, S is better than S. Right. Uh, so what I have to do is uh, the equations of C inside S inside P5. So I write down the six equations. The six equations of S, and then I plus the three equations U times F5, V times F5, and W times. Right? And these are three cubic equations. So all of this is part of the Petri analysis. Lots of people here have seen this many times before. Right? If you want to see the equations of a canonical curve, that, that's, uh, uh, you get the six equations defining. So I want to sort of take these equations here and uh, you know, allow them to move around a little bit so that, so that what? <coughs> So that instead of six of them vanishing on S, five of them vanish on this S5. Right? So how can this, so you know, it's a sort of completely crazy question. How can this Veronese surface area of degree four uh, deform into this uh, uh, surface S5? Takes a plane. Say? And Lequist would have said it gets a plane. It, it, it does get a plan. It does get a plan. So uh, the, in my treatment, in my treatment, I really want to look at the graded ring of C, and I want to write it in some, uh, you know, idiosyncratic form, in order that it can be moved sideways. Yeah. And so what I'm going to do is say, observation. Every term in F5 is divisible by U or V cubed or W to 5. W cubed. Yes, this is a quintic equation in UV and W. So the polynomials in there that are not divisible by U are quintic polynomials, quintic monomials in U, in V and W, and a quintic monomial in V and W necessarily has to have either V cubed or W cubed in it. Right? This is a completely trivial trick. Right? And so this means that I can write F as um, U times A plus V cubed times B plus W cubed C. So as Fabrizio says, uh, if you would want to do this in classical geometric, uh, classical geometric terms, you have to take this Veronese surface there and add a plane to it. Right? Take one of the conics in it and add, a, add that, that, that plane. That's now Gorenstein uh, co-dimension 3 and it's a nice variety. Right? And so uh, here I'm doing something different with the three coordinates of P3. Right, and then uh, if I do this, then uh, uf5, uf5 is x1a plus, um, at this point I need my glasses, x2, x4, b plus, I think x2, x3 in your notation. x3, x3. So minus 
V squared is extreme. Well, so, so, uh, so it's no, X2 sorry. extreme P. Uh, let, let me write down what's here, because uh, when I wrote this, I was uh, thinking uh, x two a plus x4 squared b. You, you want this to be x3, x4, I think. x2, x3. At least. Uh, oh, 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 OK, let's, anyway, plus x5, x6, c, x3, a, plus x4, x5, b. Okay, so let me try and. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm sorry. Let me change the matrix. Yeah, you're, you're, you're exactly right. Okay, so. Yeah. So, so, so this is just a general symmetric matrix, but the convention is that x1 is being interpreted as u squared, x2 as uv, so then x3 is uw. Right, and so and so now, uh, uh, now I have my six. Now, now I know these nine equations. So the nine equations are the, the wedge of the wedge of this, together with these three equations. Uh, and um, so, so these these three equations can also, of course, be written as some matrix times uh, uh, ABC. So lo lots of different ways of writing this as a matrix. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to do something idiosyncratic. So I'm going to write down r consider the six by six extra symmetric matrix. Uh, so he's going to have zero zero zero. Then he has this x one x two x three x4, x5, x6, and then my symmetric, x2, x3, x5, and then x6, c, minus x4, b, a. Okay, so who is that? So again, this is a six by six skew symmetric matrix. It's made up of four three by three blocks. Right? This block here is symmetric. Right? This is a symmetric this is symmetric. And this block here is a constant multiple of this block here. Right? This is this is what's called extra symmetric. So extra symmetric matrices are guaranteed to give you uh, Gorenstein co-dimension four varieties. This is a peculiar way of writing down the equations of P two cross P two. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, uh, when you see this, you think, "Oh, this is great." What I'm going to do is replace these zeros by something non-zero, by some lambda, and then uh, that deforms the equations. Okay. <coughs> So the only problem with this is that these, uh, these, as I said, these these elements here are multiples of these elements by some uh, scalars. In this case, the scalar zero. However, oh, this scalar zero has degree minus two, and so I can't replace them by a polynomial of degree minus two because there aren't any. Right. So this fails. This is uh, this would give a this would give a tom, and this uh, fails. So there's no tom. And what I have to do is a jerry. However, this fails, but it does tell me that the variable x1 is an unprojection variable. Right? So think about how this x1 appears in equations. He appears x1 times x4, 
x1 times x5, x1 times x6, and x1 times a. That's the only way he appears in the equation. <coughs> so it, he's, uh, he's doing exactly what uh, the thing I'm rubbing out here. x1 uh, appears linearly, appears only linearly in four equations and not in the other five. Right? So uh, you can see x1 times x4 equals something, x1 times x6 equals something, x1 times x, x5, x6, these three guys here. Uh, and then x1 times a. So x1 does not multiply these two terms because he's in the same row. Right? Fafians, when you make Fafians, you're not allowed to have multiply elements in the same row or column. And uh, x1 is in the same row and column as, as these guys. Right? So the four equations, x1, x4, x5, x6, and a. Right? And so if I do x1 hat, eliminate x1 from the calculation, then um, uh, it's very easy to see what, that, what this is. Right? Namely, suppose I cancel that top row. Right? Then I've lost x1 from the matrix entirely, and I've still got a 5 by 5 skew symmetric matrix. So uh, it so happens in this case, all I have to do is this. 0, x2, x4, x5, x3, x5, x6. So that's just this, that's just, the thing I'm writing down is just this matrix with the top row cancelled. x6, c, minus x4, b, and a. Right, and, uh, uh, So this is a Jerry 4-5. Okay, so uh, what I mean by that is that the seven entries in row and column, so in this case column, are four and five, are in the ideal uh, x4, x5, x6 and a. Yeah, so I hope, uh, so, so, uh, you know, earlier I was talking about Tom matrices and I explained what they were in, in terms of this example, right? So there's another example which is called Jerry and Jerry is associated with P1 cross P1 cross P1 in more or less the same way as Tom was here. Yeah? But uh, here the rule is I'm going to take these last two rows and columns, and of the seven entries there, I'm going to demand three coincidences among them. So before I had these two coincidences, and that was Jerry, uh, that was Tom, so here, here this is Jerry, and the coincidences are x5 equals x5, this guy, this guy here is just a multiple of this one, and this guy is a multiple of this one. Right? So these are three coincidences, it means instead of having Instead of having seven independent elements there, I have essentially only four independent elements and some repetitions. Right? And the nice thing about that is that the zero, which is at the top right-hand corner of that matrix, is, a, is not just zero, but is also a degree zero. Yeah? And so uh, if I replace this by lambda, and then just the same thing, <coughs> then this, um, so, so now, so the point is that lambda is not, when lambda is not equal to zero, so it means that uh, the lambda appears in syzygies.
Right, so, so every entry of the matrix here appears in, in uh, well, it appears in two zisages, but there'll be a third one somewhere or other, and so on, and gets rid of, gets rid of defining equations. Right, and so whereas this guy here was defined, this guy here is defined by six quadratic equations vanishing along S plus three other equations, now, when lambda is not equal to zero, it means that three of these equations are actually just multiples of these. So the, you know, this, uh, these equations change a bit. They move around as they have to in order to uh, contain S5 instead of S. Okay? So, uh, um, so how to put... How to put X1 back in? Well, uh, you know, I mean, there's a little bit of technology here. Basically, it's just, you know, you get used to doing, uh, I mean, of course, I can do it by hand now, but you can also do it by computer algebra, which for some people is more convincing. So, uh, the point is that this, this A here, when you look at this matrix, you notice that you could also project out the A. If you project out the A, you're going from co-dimension 3 to co-dimension 2, you're going to a co-dimension 2 complete intersection, that contains lambda equals x2 equals x3 equals 0. And, um, and, then, and then you can put the, put the A back in. So uh, uh, let, me, let me just write down the answer here without, without explaining it too much. So, so as I said, both Tom and Jerry appear in hundreds of calculations for co-dimension 3, uh, for co-dimension 4, Fano threefolds. A, I have, uh, together with Gavin Brown, I have a little uh, paper out in uh, our archive uh, about about six months ago. Right. So the equations. So I'm not explaining this. The equations a hat are um, And then there's also one equation, and then there's a final long equation, which is x1a plus x2x4b plus x3x6c minus lambda c x5. So, uh, so, so we're doing a Jerry Ann projection. When you're doing a Jerry Ann projection, the thing to look for so this guy here is the pivot of the Jerry. So I told you 4, 5. This guy is in the ideal. Uh, he's, he's really in, in the ideal twice. In fact, he vanishes twice on the unprojection divisor. Right, so this guy A is completely different. But this, in this case, the A is nice, clean variable. He's not a multiple of a variable, a linear combination of different variables. He's actually one of the variables. So in this case, I can project out A redo the calculation to put the x1 back in and then uh, anyway this is now now an automatic uh, thing of course you can also do it this uh, unprojection the Kristen miller unprojection is a completely standard piece of computer technology uh stavros papadakis recently wrote a preprint uh, doing it in macaulay 2 we've had a, a version of it running in magma for about a year now so it's, uh, you know, it's just completely, completely. So, uh, uh, you know, this allows us to, I'm sorry, I'm out of time. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. So, um, anyway, uh, you know, we have hundreds of these. The, uh, uh, one of the, when, when you do V2 of P135 and the uh, uh, hypersurfaces in there, you get, um, you know, this is the thing we were talking about lunchtime yesterday. You get uh, this example studied by Liu Wenfei. Uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, 
So uh, I was hoping to make a couple of technical remarks about those, uh, how to factorize those spinner coordinates of the orthogonal uh, grass manual, but uh, I don't really have time. In any case, uh, what I had to say was not in any way worked out or finished work. So, th so there, are two or three, there are two or three papers. There's this one with Gavin Brown, which is on, on Archive, been on Archive for about six months, I don't know. And, uh, we have, we have another couple of papers coming out, you know, w within a short period, with some expository material on this as well. Thank you.